Wow, 2020. Does anybody remember a year like 2020? It has been something to say the least. We've had earthquakes, we've had wildfires, we've got a pandemic, we've got worries about other pandemics that may come up. Uh, we've got strife between nations, you know, U.S. and uh, North Korea spent a lot of time uh, back and forth with each other. The U.S. and Iran have spent time back and forth with each other. We've got uh, tension and division between the people in our country along so many different lines. Um, there's been uh, riots and, and just on and on and on. These are just some of the big things that have, that have gone on. And, and 2021 is, is off to a little bit of a bumpy start. And all of this has put people in a sense of crisis uh, with anxiety and worry uh, about what's going on. Um, you know, the, people are worried about getting sick from, from the pandemic or something else. Uh, they got the new vaccines out, but people, so many people don't know, well, do, do I trust the new vaccine? Do I take the vaccine? When am I getting the vaccine? Just tons of things to worry about there. Um, people are concerned about their safety with all the, the tensions between people because of race, because of being police, not being police the rich, the poor, it's divisions along so many lines and they're spilling out into violence and protests and riots. And so people are, are genuinely concerned about whether they're going to be safe in this time. Uh, people are concerned about their, their economic security. A lot of people have been put out of work. Uh, people have seen their businesses fail because of having to be closed. Uh, even people that are doing okay right now are worried about, well, what happens if the economy continues to, to, to go down? You know, am I going to lose my job? Um, is it going to destroy my uh, retirement? Um, people uh, worry about, um, you know, with all the, the stimulus packages, uh, are taxes going to go out of control? With all this money being dumped into the economy, uh, you know, what's that going to do to inflation? So people are, are stressed about their money. Um, people worry about uh, the election results. You know, a lot of people doubt the validity of the uh, election results. And, um, of course, this has created tension between different people and tension between people and their, their government. You know, a lot of people say... Uh, well, have I lost my voice in my government? Has democracy died? Um, so it's, you know, we saw a lot of that frustration and tension spill over due to people's doubts and worries when they, um, the protests at the Capitol, you know, some people breached the Capitol and they had a little bit of a riot break out there. Unfortunately, it resulted in some deaths and injuries. Uh, so we, Man, it's just it's just out of control, and just so many different things going on and weighing people down. And as people have been locked down, or as people have seen these things happen, felt like they lost their voice or lost their money or were worried about their money, depression is just over. It's just so many so many people depressed now. Um, suicide is just. The rates right now are probably higher than they've ever been in this country and going higher. Um, child abuse is on the rise. Uh, as people are locked down together, families together, uh, or as people are feeling the frustrations and, 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 and they've got all this pent up uh, anger or anxiety, they lose, you know, they're losing. Good people are losing their, their patience with their children. Um, you know, there's always um, bad parents out there that, that, that are going to be abusive toward their children, but you've even got, uh, got good parents that are losing it on their children. And, 
you know, domestic violence is going up. Of course, money is a is always a huge catalyst for for domestic violence and divorce. Uh, but now, with the worries being out of control about money and all these other issues, the, that's going way up. Uh, substance abuse always a problem in this country. So many of the medications that people legitimately need are addictive, but then um, you have uh, people that are, you know, have the tendencies to be substance abusers anyway, whether it be with uh, alcohol or legitimate medications or, um, you know, stuff they're buying on the streets. Uh, it's just spiraling, spiraling out of control. It's very sorrowful, all the things you see going on to people that, uh, you know, besides the people that have the proclivity to these things, the good people out there that are just losing it and turning in the wrong directions. Um, violent crime. Man, I, I don't need to tell you where violent crime is at. Just turn on the news and look at buildings being burnt, stores being looted, uh, people fighting in the streets. Um, it's obvious it's getting out of control. And, and then the murder rates are, are skyrocketing. Uh, you got cities that, in, in, that are seeing murder rates in, in just a month hit what they often see in a year. So, yeah, it's, it's 2020. Let me tell you, and it's getting to people. And, uh, you know, so what do people do? They're, they're, they're being overwhelmed. Um, what is the answer for people in this situation as they're in a sense of crisis? Um, you know, at, at a time like this, what would Jesus do? I don't mean to sound glib. Uh, you know, when I say, what should you do? Well, what would Jesus do? You know, you hear that. It's, it's a catchphrase now, but it's, it's a legitimate question because with that question, you find the answer. What would Jesus do? Well, we get an example from Mark chapter 14. Uh, Jesus has just celebrated the Passover with his 12 disciples. And... Um, during this uh, time of gathering, he reveals that uh, one of the 12, which you know we later learn is Judas Iscariot, uh, is going to betray him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been betrayed by a, a friend or, or a family member, or, but if you have, you know that, that's a painful thing, to have somebody betray your trust or to have somebody uh, sell you out in some way. And, uh, you know, Jesus had just spent nearly three years with this guy, uh, night and day. He'd been giving to this guy so much of himself, uh, showing this guy the way. Of course, you know, Jesus, he wasn't caught by surprise, yet nonetheless, that had to hurt to have one of his inner circle betray him. Uh, what's more and Jesus revealed this to the 12 disciples. He said, you know, you guys are all going to be offended tonight because of me. And he knew that these guys, they, you know, they were going to ghost on him when, when things started to go down. Uh, they were, they were going to abandon him. You know, John followed from afar, but none of these guys were there beside him as he was going through his, his trial and his, his suffering. And uh, he knew that. He told them. And, you know, that's got to be, uh, be very, very painful if you, I, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this, but when you get into a tight and all of a sudden there's no friends or family around, uh, maybe they don't want to be caught up in the mess you're caught up in. Maybe it scares them. Um, maybe they're worried about being identified uh, as being in the wrong in some way if they think you're in the wrong. Whatever the reason, to be standing there all alone. Uh, Got to be painful, and, and, and it's a fearful situation to be uh, in, in tough times on your own. Uh, Jesus revealed to, to Peter, one of the 12 disciples, he said, uh, you know, Peter was always gung-ho in, uh, in word. He's like, no, I won't be offended. I'll, I'll follow you to the death. 
And uh, Jesus had to tell him, look, you're going to deny me tonight. You're going to deny even, even know me. And uh, that turned out to be the case. Um, what a, a hard situation. If that's not crisis, I don't know what it is to have somebody abandon you to the point that they deny they even know you. Um, Jesus knew that uh, he was fixing to face an illegal trial. Uh, he knew that uh, in the course of the, of, of the trial and um, in, in the course of the efforts of the, the Jewish leaders to get rid of him, that he was going to be mocked, he was going to be humiliated, he was going to be beaten. You know, by the time the, the, the Jewish leaders got through with him, and then the Romans too, the Bible tells us he was beaten so badly you couldn't hardly even tell he was a man. He was, you know, you couldn't identify who he was. And, and really, um, listening to uh, doctors that have read the gospel accounts, it's a wonder Jesus survived the beating. And he knew this was coming beforehand. Um, he knew he was going to be executed in one of the uh, most humiliating and uh, torturous ways there was at the time to be crucified. You've got prolonged suffering as you fight to breathe, but your efforts to position your body to be able to breathe uh, causes pain because of the nails or the bindings on the cross. Uh, so it's a back and forth situation. And, and some of these guys, now Jesus only lived a few years, but remember the beating, he, or a few hours, but remember the beating he had taken beforehand uh, that he, he probably shouldn't have survived to begin with. And, um, you know, but some of these guys would live for days before they, they finally passed. And, and Jesus knew all this was coming. Can you imagine knowing beforehand that all this is going to happen to you. Um, can you imagine the fear? Most men, when they are facing their death, they know it's coming, they find it somewhat fearful. Even those that, that name the name of Christ, uh, you know, it's the unknown. Uh, so most men will find this situation fearful. And remember, Jesus was 100% man, but 100% man, but uh, God. It's a divine miracle that God should be able to come and be man in the flesh and still be God. And so he knew this was, this was coming. Um, and probably the greatest uh, pain that he, he was suffering, the greatest fear or anxiety uh, that was part of his crisis uh, was knowing that he, who was perfect and holy without sin, was about to have all the sin of the world, the sin of every person of the world, from the past to the current time to the future, laid on him as he became the sacrifice for us. Um, you know, that being that he was uh, God... Uh, that had to be pretty revolting that, that he as a holy God is about to, as the scriptures say, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He's about to have all the sins of the world laid on him. So uh, let me read uh, from Mark chapter 14, starting with verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. Now this is after they left the room where they celebrated the Passover. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. He's, he's in crisis here. He, these are um, the emotions that he uh, as a man and he as God are, 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 are feeling, knowing what's to come. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Um, I don't know if any of you have had uh, sorrow uh, over a situation or depression to the point where you uh, 
were willing to die or ready to die or even attempted to die. I don't know if, um, if you've ever experienced sorrow to the point that you thought it was going to kill you, uh, which, uh, you know, is, is actually medically possible that a person could be in such sorrow. But Jesus said, hey, this stuff is weighing on me so much it's about to kill me. So he says, uh, you know, sit here, sit here and watch for me. Sit here and pray for me. Um, and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Confident, uh, as you were, couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh a third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest, it is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. So Jesus, in his uh, time of crisis chose to spend time alone with the Father. He went and he prayed. Uh, this is not the first time that Jesus was in a position of what we would call crisis, a, a challenging situation. Um, remember in Matthew 4, Satan came and, and tempted Jesus. So Jesus, before Satan came, what did he do? The scripture says he fasted and he prayed. Um, so Jesus was not new to crisis, and his, his re reaction in both instances that are listed in the gospel are the same. He prayed. Now, Jesus actually, as we learn from the four gospels, made prayer a routine. We see some instances where he prayed publicly, and uh, in one case, you know, he says that it's not because he doubted the Father would hear him. He knew the Father always heard him, but he prayed so that the people would hear him and, and understand his relationship with the Father. Um, but we, uh, we see also that, uh, you know, while he prayed a few times in public, he had a routine of getting alone, getting away from the people, and spending a time just alone with the Father. Now, if this is not a habit for you of spending time alone with the Father, of spending time in prayer, then you may uh, yet be facing another crisis, a spiritual crisis. And in that situation, all of the crisis uh, that the world may uh, lay on you, all of the worries and anxieties and stresses that you may feel from being uh, a human being living on this earth are going to be that much worse. Prayer needs to be a routine for you, but especially, especially in time of crisis. Now, I, I say this, I point out that Jesus prayed in time of crisis, and I emphasize that we should do the same um, because it can be hard to do. Um, you know, sometimes we get so worried or so overwhelmed by uh, situations that, that it's, it's hard to stop and get along with the Father and, and pray. Um, we're so caught up in what's going on. And, and sometimes it can be challenging because we're like, I don't even know what to say. This is, I mean, this is just, man, you know, I, I don't have words for this. And the beautiful thing about that 
is uh, if you look in Romans 8, chapter, tw or, uh, chapter 8, verse 26, you see that when we are in that situation, that the Holy Spirit of God will actually, the Bible says, make intercession for us uh, with groanings that cannot be uttered. Um, the Holy Spirit of God will actually do the praying for us. So when it's that overwhelming, when it's that challenging, when you don't have the words, get alone with God anyway. Just, just be in his presence and, and, and just feel how you feel and let him know how you feel. The Spirit will pray the, the words that need to be prayed for you. Um, and, and, you know, another time this can be hard and challenging, especially for us guys, um, is we think our society has conditioned us uh, that we've always got to be tough. Uh, we've always got to be strong. We've got to, to stand up to the challenge. We've got to fix what's wrong, defeat what's evil. We've got to handle it. And, um, you know, men, especially men with families, should... Uh, desire to be strong and stand up for them and take care of things as as men that's their responsibility but you have to remember uh, that you are human and you've only got just so much and none of us are any tougher than Christ are you tougher than Christ can you take the mockery and the beating and the crucifixion that he did can you fast in the wilderness for 40 days. I mean, Jesus was not a pansy. He was a man's man. And can we say that any of us are any tougher than that? It's it's comes to the point where, you know, I, and I've learned this the hard way, it's a lot easier to be tough and strong and handle what's got to be handled if you're doing it in the power and the might of God Almighty, your fleshly strength is only going to take you just so far. And, um, you know, really, even those minor things that you can handle uh, as a man uh, on your own still become so much easier if you're doing them in the power and strength of God. But certainly the big challenge is certainly when you're in a time of crisis. Now, another time when it can be hard to take situations to God, um, when you're in a sense of crisis um, and it can be hard to pray, uh, is when things are not going as you think they should, and you become angry, especially if, if you get angry with God, especially if you're blaming him for the situation at hand. Um, this is another thing that I'm, I know from personal experience. Things are not going right. You're in a sense of crisis. You're angry. Perhaps you're blaming God a little bit. You don't want to talk to him. He, it's all his fault. You're blaming him. You, so... Uh, you know, why would you want to talk to him about it? I mean, why is he going to help you out of this situation or through this situation if he let it happen in the first place? That is okay. That is a perfectly... Listen, God knows we're human. He made us, right? God has emotion. He knows that he has put within us emotions, he knows that um, sometimes we get angry and been out of shape. I mean, we can see uh, uh, some of his great prophets and, and leaders in the Old Testament times when they got uh, depressed about a situation or got angry. You know, Job got angry with God about, um, first off, not wiping out the Ninevites. And, and then when he's sitting up there waiting for the judgment to fall on them, meanwhile, they're down there repenting and getting right with God, and he's sparing them. You know, he's sitting under the, the shade of a vine that God caused to spring up, but then God kills the vine with a worm, and he's angry at God. Listen, we have emotions, and because we are human, we don't always handle them well. But, 
you know, as hard as it can be to go talk to God in that situation, that's just the time to go talk to God in that situation. Tell God, hey, I'm scared. Or, or tell God, hey, I'm mad. And, and I kind of blame you for it. Um, God will understand. He's not going to wipe you out just because you get sideways from a situation. Go Now, if you keep trying to handle it on your own with that kind of attitude, you're just going to dig your own hole. But if you go to them and say, look, this is how I am feeling. And I need to know right now, you know, how do you see me in this situation? And, and, and um, you know, I need to, I need to know that you, you're, you're there and you've still got this and that you understand the way I'm feeling. And then, you know, this is going to sound a little bit um, super spiritual to some folks. But, you know, whenever you go and talk to God about a situation, especially if, you, if you've got feelings that you need to lay out in honesty for him, um, then take the time to listen to his reply. You know, now we, we get so much about God and so many answers from God through reading his word. But I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. We see through the scriptures where God spoke to men uh, um, and women. Uh, he spoke to people uh, all throughout scriptures. Well, God will still speak to you if you will take the time to listen. Uh, it may be um, through his word. It may be. Uh, a, a feeling, you know, I, I'll go so as far as to say that you might actually uh, uh, hear a, a word from God. He, you know, whatever it is that he, however it is that he feels that he needs to communicate with you, if you'll shut up and listen and be patient, you know, take the time to listen, he's going to respond to you and... Um, let you know how he's feeling. And, you know, Jesus was honest with God when he prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he said, look, you know, I know with you everything's possible, and I know you can take this situation, you know, away from me. You, you know, this cup that, that, that I'm, that is to be mine, um, you know, you can take it away. You could, you could make another way, um, you can take away the, the feelings I've got. You know, there's so many things you can do here, God, to make this situation, or Father, that, that you can make this situation better or go away altogether. But then he said, I know your will is better. He said, not your will, not my will, but thine be done. I know your will is better. I know your way is better. I know you got this. Um, so, um, basically... Um, give me the strength to follow the course that you laid out. Give me the strength to receive this cup. Give me the strength to follow your will. Now, you don't see those exact words there, but I'm not putting words in Scripture. Read what he's saying. Uh, all things are possible unto thee. Well, if they're all possible unto God the Father, then, uh, you know, God can give him what he needs. He says, take away the cup from me. Nevertheless... Not what I will, but what thou will. If he's committing to say, hey, I'm willing to follow your will. Uh, I'm willing to follow your course. Uh, then all you have to do is understand that, that he's saying, hey, if I'm willing and all things are possible with you, I need the strength to do it. You know, I'm ready to go forward in your strength. So Jesus was completely honest with the Father. And... Um, he was willing then to listen and, and uh, wait to, to take and follow the Father's course. I know that he was willing to wait and to listen because he prayed three times. Uh, so he took the time and was patient um, to uh, discuss the situation with God and then move forward as needed to, to happen. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out here. I don't know if you picked up on this or... Uh, if you missed it, uh, because our focus has been on the praying. But remember when he went, the scripture tells us he took 
Peter and James and John. He separated those from the other uh, 11 disciples that he had left praying at the, at, the, at the edge of the garden and took them a little further with him and said, hey, you guys sit here and pray with me. Now, Jesus had, had told them about the, um, the uh, betrayal that was coming. He told them they were going to be offended. He had told Peter he was going to deny them. So they had clues as to where Jesus was at. He had been you know, telling them all along the way, uh, giving them indications of, of the course that was going to follow. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I think they were missing that he had to be crucified. Um, I think they still thought he was going to set up the kingdom by force there. But um, nonetheless, you know, he, they didn't have maybe all the details, maybe, you know. But he was still blessed by the fact that those three were, were, you know, near to him as he prayed. And, uh, you know, he asked them to pray. Uh, quite clearly, they didn't pray as fervently as he did, uh, as we see by them continuing to fall asleep. Um, but he still found a, a blessing by having them closer to him. You know, in times of crisis, Prayer is the number one thing, time with the Father. Uh, but it's good to get some close friends uh, around you, to be near close friends. And um, you don't ever want to deal with the troubles of life uh, in isolation. Uh, that just makes things tougher. Believe me, I've I've tried it over and over again. I'm I have to learn things the hard way, and and a lot of times, you know, it's a great thing that life gives repeat lessons because sometimes I have to take some of the courses over again. But dealing with things in isolation is only going to make your problem problem worse. Now, maybe you can't give your friends all the details, but just hey, you guys. Pray for me, you know. So you spend time with them, but uh, gathering, you know, strength and fellowshipping with them uh, so that you're not dealing with things all out there on an island. Uh, but then, you know, saying, hey, I need you guys to pray for me. You know, if you want to give them details, give them details. If Give them a little bit or, or give them nothing at all. You know, we many times in churches, you know, have people, hey, I got unspoken requests. There are some things that are very deep and personal uh, that you just really can't talk about. Um, if you've got somebody close enough to talk to, that's great. Uh, of course, you've always, always, always got God the Father to talk to about. Uh, but just knowing that, hey, somebody else is saying your name in prayer can be a great, uh, great uh, pickup. So... What do we do in times of crisis? Well, what did Jesus do? If going to the Father in prayer and surrounding himself with, a, with some close friends was good enough for Jesus in times of crisis, then that is good enough for us.